Lord, we are so grateful for this wonderful time that you have given to us. We thank you, Lord, because you are with us. Thank you, Lord, because um, um, you orchestrate things that we can go together and have fellowship with you, Lord God. And Lord, as we, um, as we have fellowship with the book of John, Lord, help us to understand what are you trying to tell us. And also, Lord, um, give us wisdom on how to deal people and also on how to um, how to interact in a godly manner, Lord God. And Lord, we also pray for Pastor Dane as as he's going to lead us in this um, in this subject. Lord, we pray for for him that you will give him wisdom and also Lord insights on how we can grow together in this journey. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in our fellowship, in our discussion, in in your word. This all we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys are right. Okay. <clears throat> Is my voice uh, loud or uh, yeah, that was great. Uh, low or what? It was perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, no, that was an excellent prayer. Thank you. Uh, I like how you asked for wisdom that we uh, know how to live as God's people, because that's what the book of John is about. It's explaining to the church the rule of life. How do we practically love God and love one another, um, the rule of Christ? So uh, with that forefront in our minds, tonight uh, we come to two firsts in the book of John or the book of first John where he's going to for the first time um, talk about therefore because of all of these things we have confidence so we saw the word confidence already once but tonight we come to uh, where that confidence comes from what is the source of that confidence and we'll see that it is found founded upon uh, our faith in Jesus Christ that has saved us that is our positional truth. Um, and also when we are in God's will, when we uh, understand his word and we are living in that, even if we don't have opportunities to be, uh, <clears throat> to be demonstrating that love towards our brothers. If we have a situation where we, uh, where we are not called to um, give to our brothers, uh, we might worry that we're not doing enough. But we can still have confidence that we know it's it's about the heart matters to God, uh, not about the work matters to God. So that if in our lives God has not called us to go out and be missionaries or to go out and uh, run charity organizations that share the gospel, um, that doesn't mean we're not doing enough. Uh, we've already done enough. We've believed in the name of Jesus Christ, and that is enough. And on that note, that's the second first that John will t give us tonight. This will be the very first mention in the first epistle of John of faith in Christ leading to salvation. It is the first time he mentions first tense salvation. Until now, he has only been speaking to believers about their current state as believers. Now we're going to see the process together where the two commandments of Jesus Christ are to believe in his name and to love one another. And that is his commandment to the unbelieving world to believe in him and his commandment to the believing world to love one another. So that's our brief intro here to 1 John 3, 18 through 24 as we finish the third chapter of John. <coughs> so a little bit of reminder from last week, verse 18 we did last week. Uh, and it says, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Now, that was his summary statement for 11 through 18. So we want to remember last week's lesson. And he says, we will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So the first thing we want to remind ourselves is, what is the this in verse 19? We will know by this. Well, how do we know um, that we are of the truth? John gave us a practical uh, test for 
uh, if we are doing this, we can know for sure. Now, remember, in John's work, the obverse, that means the opposite, is not always true. So if we are doing this, we can have confidence that we are in truth, because this behavior can only be manifested through the righteousness of Christ. If we are not manifesting this righteousness through Christ, that gives us two options. Either we are in Christ and not walking in Christ, or we are not in Christ and have never been in Christ. Uh, we as believers have to come to the one conclusion that we are in Christ. That is a positional truth. Therefore, we are either walking in that truth or we are not. So if we are not, we don't lose confidence uh, in our salvation. We lose confidence in our walk. And we need to remember that Jesus Christ is the confidence of our walk when we fix our eyes on him when we're in the word and we're in prayer with him, we're in fellowship um, and we walk in his will, that is when we can know for sure <clears throat> uh, that we are in the truth, not saved, but in the truth. So it says, by this we will know, what is he talking about? He says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So love, its ultimate manifestation is self-sacrifice for another to the extent of death following the example of christ but remember christians don't always have the opportunity or the call from god to die for one another jesus christ was the one who was called to die for all of us but that does not mean that there are not opportunities for us to demonstrate practically our love to others by uh, caring for them. And one way John gives us an example here, he says, but whoever has the world's goods, that is life-sustaining goods, and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Now, last week we discussed how this isn't always material goods. It can be food and water and shelter and practical uh, <clears throat> ways that people survive. It's the necessities that we have for daily life. Uh, but I was also having a conversation this week about, uh, about children and how children who aren't given a hug by their mother, uh, if they're never held by the mother, uh, they might develop uh, behavioral problems as adults. They're not given those bios, those worldly goods, uh, the love and affection of a mother. Um, and so they are not able to live properly because they have not been uh, have not been given that. And uh, even sick children sometimes they'll be mysteriously sick, and the one thing that's able to cure them is to be held skin to skin with their mother. Uh, so even something like love and affection uh, can be this bios uh, that we are to give to one another. Just sitting and listening to someone else whose heart is aching, speaking with them about um, Christ and about our position in him, keeping our eyes on the future, waiting for his return and our glorious future together with him. These are also things where we sacrifice our time for our brothers and sisters. Uh, this can be uh, one way where we demonstrate practically our love for one another. It's giving up of ourselves um, in order to serve God by serving others. So when we are engaged in that sort of behavior, when our heart is directed towards that behavior and seeking opportunities to love God uh, by loving one another, then we have confidence that we are walking in the truth. We have confidence that we're in fellowship because we want to be in fellowship and serving. <clears throat> so John says that by this we'll have confidence. When our heart condemns us, that means when we look and look at ourselves and saying, I'm not doing enough. Well, we, we need to have confidence through that because even if we perceive that we're not doing enough, uh, Jesus Christ knows our heart and it's not about what we're doing, but what we're prepared to do. Uh, so there are two sorts of confidence that John is going to talk about. We have confidence looking forward to the future judgment where we will stand before the throne of God and we will know for certain uh, that we will be accepted by him and we're seeking the rewards on that day that we'll be able to glorify him uh, by having served him in this life. But another confidence that we are going to talk about uh, is the confidence here and now that we have, 
that we can approach the throne of God in prayer. Uh, and that's going to be John's main idea in this section is what confidence do we have right now in this life? We have the confidence in the future, therefore we have the confidence right now. So his future confidence, he's going to talk about more in chapter four. He says, by this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. <clears throat> so he's going to get to that confidence in his argument, but he's going to start with the here and now. And Paul does a very similar thing whenever he's talking about confidence. Uh, he correlates that with prayer because prayer is something we can do confidently before the Lord, knowing that he hears our prayers, that whenever we are uh, in the spirit speaking to God, the spirit translates those prayers so that they become perfected and, and the Lord hears them as if, uh, as if having a translator, one person speaking one language, another, another language, uh, you don't know if the other person is hearing you. But when you have a translator, you know for certain that that is being heard. When we are praying in the spirit, the spirit carries that prayer uh, and perfects it. Now, God can understand our prayers even without the spirit, uh, but the spirit gives us confidence in our prayers. <clears throat> so uh, in 1 Thessalonians 1, <clears throat> 2 through 3, sorry, uh, Paul says, we give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love. So there's faith and love together. That's going to be a major concept here in John and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father, <clears throat> knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. So we know our salvation is certain and sure and finished. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. So Paul is talking about experiential salvation, the ability of the Christian to live in accordance with the rule of Christ because of the spirit living within him, the confidence that he has in the gospel. We're looking back at the cross, what is finished for our salvation, what we have trusted in and, and received eternal life through that faith and looking forward to the completion of that salvation. That gives us confidence now so that we can be about the work of Christ, the labor of love um, that he is speaking of. That it's not an arduous or a difficult labor, but it's one of love where we are abiding in Christ and he is working through us. <clears throat> so he says, we prove this among you. So Paul says, we were a physical example of this that we were manifesting the love of Christ by abiding in him. So Paul is saying, follow our example, not because we are exemplary of the example, but because Christ has made us exemplary of the example. <clears throat> so Paul, uh, or no, this is John, John uh, 21, 17. <clears throat> this goes back to the idea in 320. So let's read that again. Um, in 19 and 20, John had said, we will know by this that we are of the truth. So when righteousness is practically experiential within our lives, when we um, are manifesting this love of Christ and it's visible, we have confidence. Uh, we know that we are the truth and this will assure our hearts before him in whatever our hearts condemn us. So if our hearts are condemning us, if our hearts are saying you're not doing enough, we have confidence because God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So Jesus Christ had asked Peter a question uh, in John 21, 17. This is the gospel of John. He says uh, to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, this is the third time that John is, or Peter has said, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Uh, and the third time he asks him, he gets a little flustered. So Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. 
So Peter understood that Jesus searches the hearts of men. Jesus understands the heart condition. So that even if Peter is not able to demonstrate that practically, uh, even if Peter is not able to uh, have confidence in himself, he is able to have confidence in Christ. And Christ knows his heart and knows that it is for Christ that he is uh, walking in the light. <clears throat> So this should give us rest. This should confidence is our faith rest. When we have this confidence, we are able to rest knowing for sure uh, that our salvation has been finished on the cross and it will be present uh, at the return of Christ. And right now we live in that position. I didn't put any verses in from Hebrew or from Ephesians, but if you read the first chapter of Ephesians, you'll see our position with Christ in the heavenlies is the term that Paul uses. Uh, but here in Hebrews 4, Hebrews is where we learn a lot about our faith rest. Uh, in Hebrews 4.10, uh, we read, For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his work, as God did from his. Now this is going back all the way to the Genesis principle of resting on the seventh day. Uh, but it's tying in... Uh, because this is written to the Hebrews, with Sabbath day rest. For them, that was a commandment. For us, Sabbath day rest is not a commandment, because we have a much more perfect rest, that we rest in Christ, uh, not in the promise of Christ, but in the, uh, in the promise that Christ has already come, in the full knowledge and confidence of that. So it says, for one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, we no longer seek to justify ourselves by works. Works never worked to justify us, but we rest in his works. Uh, just as God rested from his works when they were completed, Jesus Christ has completed that work. Therefore, we rest. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Now, this is talking about faith rest. This is talking about the confidence after saving faith that we continue to have. So we want to continue to be in that faith that saved us and secured us. When we continue in that faith, then we have confidence. We are resting uh, <clears throat> and we do not fall into disobedience. So when we are obedient, we are abiding. That's John's principle. With uh, the Hebrew author, he says when there is no disobedience here, um, you are in rest. <clears throat> and he continues, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So this is both a frightening thought for those who are uh, not seeking God's will, but a thought that gives us confidence for those who are seeking God's will. If you have decided before, to, uh, before you know the will of God to obey the will of God, then even if you don't have enough opportunities to uh, to show that experiential salvation so that others can see your faith, so that you can see your faith practically working. Uh, maybe you just don't have the, uh, the, the ministry or the opportunities that you want, but you have the confidence in Christ that he knows your heart, that even though you don't have some sort of uh, ministry to prove to yourself, uh, oh, look, I am walking in the will of God because he's blessing me in this area because he's giving me abilities in this area, because he's allowing me to share the gospel with these people. Uh, if we don't have all those opportunities, God still knows our hearts. He knows that we are prepared and ready to do those things as soon as he gives them to us. But there are times in our lives, C.S. Lewis called them troughs, where we don't have that, those kinds of opportunities, uh, where we might feel rather solitary, um, in solitude, well, those are opportunities to faith rest. We rest in Christ. We don't get uh, down in the muck and the mire and say, oh, I'm, I'm not doing as well as I was 
uh, six months ago when when I was uh, discipling three people and they were all growing in Christ and now I'm discipling no one. Um, has God taken away my ministry? Those kind of ideas. Uh, well, no, it's not a time for you to be serving in that way, but a time for you to be resting in a different way. Um, so even in times of rest, we have confidence that Jesus Christ knows our hearts. He knows we're ready and prepared for um, service. Now, I've heard this given as an example of soldiers. When they are not fighting a war, when they are not in battle, they don't know what to do with themselves. They are ready. They're equipped. They're prepared to fight. Um, but when the fighting stops, it's hard to go back to normal life. Now, we in this world, we're, we're called pilgrims. We're called uh, the army of God in some ways. We're told to constantly have on the armor of God. Uh, so at times when we have the full vestments, all of the armor of God on, but there's no battle that we're fighting at the moment, we might lose confidence in our abilities, not because there isn't uh, ability, but because there isn't opportunity to demonstrate that ability. So what this is saying is even soldiers who are not currently engaged in battle can have confidence that they are victorious because of Christ. Um, so that's the idea of faith rest, that we are confident even through trials, even through um, even through uh, periods of time where we are not actively experiencing faith, but we can still rest on our faith <clears throat> through Jesus Christ and the Spirit indwelling us. So here then comes John's idea of the experience of abiding in truth. He says, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. <clears throat> so remember, there are times when our heart condemns us, when our heart condemns us and says, you're not doing enough. We don't turn to our heart and let that dictate, but we turn to Christ and let him uh, <clears throat> ascertain where we are spiritually. But if our heart does not condemn us, which is the condition that we should reach, when our heart condemns us and we turn to Christ, our heart should no longer condemn us. Um, so if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. We want to stand confidently before God, not wishy-washy, not wondering, oh, am I doing enough? Oh, am I even saved? Um, that's probably the most dangerous of thoughts you can have. If you have put your faith in Christ, Christ is enough and you are saved. The question should be, am I walking in the light? Am I abiding in truth? Um, is the spirit filling me? Is it working in and through me? Um, those should be our questions. And if the question is negative, we need to come back into fellowship. First John 1 John 1.9 says that if, uh, if we are faithful and confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is, uh, that is basically the sum total of uh, our... <clears throat> our uh, coming back into fellowship, where in the uh, period of the law, they had the entire sacrificial system for coming back into fellowship. Certain sacrifices prescribed for certain sins, uh, certain, uh, <clears throat> certain atoning measures for the covering of sin, not the removal of sin, but it's covering. Uh, well, for us, that entire sacrificial system is not present. We don't need that. Jesus Christ has been the complete sacrifice for all of our sins. So we have one method of returning to fellowship with Christ, not a sacrificial system, but prayer and confession to Jesus Christ. That is our one, we could call it sacrifice. Um, and it's not a sacrifice. Uh, it's not at all. It's a joy that we get to come to him confidently in prayer, confessing our sins, knowing for sure, knowing certainly that those sins will be forgiven and that we will come back into fellowship with him. Uh, so then we can have that confidence before Christ that if we are not in fellowship, we can come back into fellowship on the basis of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And if we are in fellowship, then even if we aren't uh, having opportunities to demonstrate our faith, uh, God knows our faith. God knows we're prepared for battle. So it says, and whatever we ask of him, ask we receive from him. Now we can't separate this verse from everything that's come before it. Uh, 
This is speaking of fellowship when we are in God's will, when we are asking for things in his will, uh, we will receive them from him. That when we are praying for opportunity to demonstrate our faith, we're praying for opportunity to help others, uh, those kind of things, those we will receive from him. If we are praying for ourselves that we become rich, that we no longer have to worry about other Christians, if our prayers are, please, Lord God, don't send me someone to disciple. I don't want to deal with anyone right now. This is not demonstrating the love of Christ. This is not demonstrating sacrifice and love. Uh, those prayers might not be answered. He might send you three people and say, all right, work through this. Uh, but we can have confidence that he's going to be uh, there um, <coughs> working, but much better to be prepared to do his will, whatever it is. Uh, because then not only is his power going to be there to help us through it, but it's going to be an experience of love, not an experience of grief and, uh, and turmoil for us that uh, we want to be constantly in his light, working his will, um, whatever that may be, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So it says, because we keep his commandment, that is to love the brothers, and we know what that means now, and to love God. And we love God practically by, uh, by serving others. So because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. <clears throat> Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, this is coming right off that faith rest section. He says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. So remember in the last, we have confidence in Christ that he knows our hearts. And then this is the very next thing that he says. And I think it's important that these two ideas are together because he searches the hearts. And that is again, scary for those who are not in fellowship, but not really scary so much as uh, it gives them pause. God knows your heart. If your heart is in the wrong place, God will seek that out. But here's the confidence that we have. We have a high priest who has passed through the heavens. He is Jesus, the son of God. We hold fast to our confession of him. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. Jesus Christ knows what it is to live on this earth. He knows what it is to live in the human experience. Uh, he underwent the same temptations that we went. We, were, we saw those temptations uh, a few weeks back. Um, I've got a slide. Actually, I'll jump to that slide real quick. <clears throat> uh, <coughs> our three enemies in this world, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Jesus Christ was tempted with all of these things at the temptation from Satan. And he overcame them all. So we can also overcome them in him. Adam was unable to overcome them. Adam attempted to overcome these things by the flesh, not by resting in God's word and God's promise. Jesus Christ overcame by resting in God's word, by having confidence in God and God's purpose for him. Uh, so that this is the confidence that we also should have, not in ourselves, but in Christ. So it says he can sympathize with our weakness. He understands our temptations. He also understands perfectly well that he is the God man and we are only man, uh, that we have the helper of the Holy Spirit, but we are only capable of following him. When we are walking in that spirit. It says, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet he was without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence Again, that term confidence to the throne of grace. Because of Jesus Christ, we can stand confidently before the throne so that we may receive mercy. That is, when we have stumbled, when we have fallen, we do not receive the just punishment for those sins because those sins have been placed on Christ. That is mercy. We receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So we have mercy and grace um, in Christ. <clears throat> <clears throat> so in uh, 1 John 5, 14 through 15, John will say, this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, now this is different from what he said in 3, he's adding on a constraint here. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the 
that we have the request which we have asked from him. When we are in his will, um, it says it is the power of God to work and to will within us, that when God is working in us, by us resting in him, he changes our will to be in accordance with him. That when we are in fellowship with him, our will is aligned with him. So that when we are in prayer, we're asking for the things of his will. And when we are asking for the things of his will, that he is going to give us those things. Uh, <clears throat> those things might be opportunities to, sh to, uh, to love brothers uh, in the way that Christ would have us love them by the power of the Spirit. I think of Solomon when he became king and and uh, Jesus or uh, the Lord told him uh, to ask what he would what he would have of the Lord and he says wisdom and a lot of times people just say that he asked for wisdom and, and God gave him wisdom but it's important the reason why he asked for wisdom he says he wants wisdom to govern the Lord's people he wants wisdom in order to serve the Lord uh, he wanted his will was aligned with God's will. God wanted his people led. And Solomon asked in God's will, um, and God gave him abundantly in that will. <clears throat> so that's the kind of prayers we want. We want our will to be aligned with God so that we are praying for the things that God wants us um, to pray for. Because had Solomon not asked for that, Solomon's reign may not have been as successful. God would have brought about his purposes through Solomon to build the temple. Uh, but God may not have blessed Solomon uh, in the same ways um, in order to bring about God's will. We see many people in scripture who were not in God's will that God used regardless, um, but their, uh, their experience could have been much better. Adam and Eve, again, is a perfect example of that. They could have been in fellowship with God, but instead... Uh, they did not trust in his word. They did not rest in him. Um, and so their experience was tarnished and sin entered into the, and in, entered into the world. Oops. <clears throat> so here then in 1 John 3, 23, we have the commandment repeated to us. Now there are two commandments here. They are not one and the same. They're not part A and part B. They are experience one and experience B, or experience A and experience B. So he says, this is his commandment. There are two commandments of Christ to two different groups of people. This is the commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. That's the entrance into the body of Christ. That when we believe in him, three things happen immediately. We are baptized by the Holy Spirit. We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And our baptizing into the Spirit is us in the body of Christ. We are baptized into the body of Christ by the Spirit. And our regeneration is our rebirth through Jesus Christ. Those are positional truths. They happen at the time of salvation. They happen by means of the Holy Spirit. So that there is Christ in us and us in Christ. Third thing that happens is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells us immediately at the time of faith. So remember, this is the first time in the epistle of John that he speaks of salvational faith, first time faith. This is not our experience as Christians that he's speaking about. This commandment is to unbelievers that they believe in Jesus Christ. If one has not been obedient to that uh, commandment, then commandment B is impossible. He has to enter into the body of Christ through commandment A. Once he is in the body of Christ, he can never leave the body of Christ. He is saved once and for all. But our experience as saved believers has to do with commandment B and love one another. This is experiential salvation. When we are in fellowship, with God, we are loving one another. That is the sure tell sign that we are in fellowship with God. If we are loving one another, just as he commanded us. So here's a commandment to the unbelievers to believe and a commandment to the believers, therefore love one another. <clears throat> so in John 8, 28 through 
29. Uh, <coughs> Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, this is before his crucifixion, then you will know that I am he. So uh, this is looking back to, uh, to what he said in 1 John 3.15, that just as Moses raised up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, so they will lift up the Son of Man. Um, and they lifted Jesus Christ up on a cross, just like uh, Mo Moses had done to the serpent in the wilderness. Um, it says, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own initiative. This is a claim to deity, a claim to equality with God from Jesus. He says that I do nothing on my own initiative, initiative but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. So this is Jesus being faithful. <clears throat> and this is the faith that we have in Jesus Christ and in his name. And in John 14, 12 through 15, a little further ahead in the book of John, um, we see this faith rest as experience. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Now, Jesus Christ is not speaking here of his miracles that confirm his deity. This does not mean that we will raise the dead. The apostles would because they were, uh, they were to confirm their message and authority as in alignment with Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ did certain miracles that confirmed that he was the Messiah such as healing a leper. Uh, those things are messianic signs, uh, things that God alone does. And God has given, uh, but God has given us works to do that uh, we would do them and, uh, and do greater works than those because Jesus Christ has gone to the Father. So he says, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So loving God, loving Jesus, is demonstrated in keeping his commandments. What were his commandments? The law of Christ was to love God and to love one another. So if we ask anything in his name, that means in accordance with his name, in accordance with his will, he will do it. Um, and this is God's glory through his son, uh, that it is on the basis, on the foundation of Jesus Christ, that we approach the throne with confidence and are able to ask in the will of Christ. And John has also mentioned then the Holy Spirit for the first time um, explicitly in the book of 1 John. Uh, and we see that this also has to do with prayer and confidence in prayer. So John 16, after he has promised that the helper will come uh, to the unbelieving world to convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and to the believer to teach them all things. So he says, in that day, you will not question me about anything. Remember, we will be taught all things through the Holy Spirit. We will not question him about things as the disciples had been questioning him through their entire ministry. But rather, truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. Now he's speaking to <clears throat> the 11 disciples in the upper room, not Judas, but he is speaking to the other 11 and he's saying that until now, you have not asked in my name. From now on, they ask in his name, and they will receive so that their joy may be made full. Now, remember way back to John 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. What was John's purpose for writing this letter? It was for fellowship among the believers. And the result of that fellowship was that his joy may be made full. Uh, this joy 
is John. Like we want to look at this letter that John has written and realize that what he's instructing us to do, his writing this letter was his fulfillment of that himself, where his joy is made full because he is working in the will of Jesus Christ. The will of Jesus Christ was for John to instruct the believers in how to live practically in the rule of life during this dispensation. John is doing that when he is writing this letter to his, to his constituents. But this isn't a new message from John either. He made that very clear in chapter two. He said, this isn't a new message. This isn't a new commandment. It's one that you've heard already. It's new when Jesus Christ taught it, but it's not new to us. John wrote this letter in about 80 AD. That was 50 years after the death of Christ. He had been preaching for 50 years the same message. John had been very faithful with the message that Jesus had given him. He had discipled uh, believers in Ephesus and all over Asia Minor and in Jerusalem. Uh, this is the culmination of John's life work of faith rest in Christ, of working in the will of Christ. And we see that his joy is made full in fellowship, that when we are in fellowship with the apostles, the apostles are in fellowship with Jesus Christ, and our joy is made full. This fullness of joy in the dispensation of grace is completely tied up with this concept of fellowship, that our joy is full when we are in fellowship with Christ. And what it means to be in fellowship with Christ um, is to be in alignment with his will, to be resting in him and in his word, for the spirit to be filling us. All of these things go hand in hand with abiding in him. Um, the fruits of the spirit, remember, it's not pick one fruit, pick two fruits. Uh, all of the fruits of the spirit are a package deal. When you're abiding with him, all of them are true of you. Uh, you don't need strengthening in one or strengthening in another. If you are abiding in him, they're all true. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have abiding and the spirit together. So this is, again, the first explicit mention by John in the book of First John of the spirit that indwells us. Until now, his focus has been purely on the faith position of Christians. Now he has, for the first time, mentioned confidence. For the first time, he's mentioned the spirit, confidence in prayer, rather. Um, and for the first time, he's mentioned, again, the faith that got us here in the first place. So now he mentions the Holy Spirit. He says, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him. When we are obedient, we are abiding. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So we know by that, that when we are uh, obedient to his commandments and his commandment is to love the brothers by loving or to love God by loving the brothers, He's just finished telling us all about how we do that. Now he says, all of this wrapped up together, we know that we are abiding in him when we are doing this. And here's the power by which we are doing this. It's by the spirit whom he has given us. That it's in the power of the spirit that we abide in Jesus Christ. In John 15, this is that chapter uh, about the vine and its branches. We read, abide in me and I in you. Remember, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. So he says, abide in me, stay in me. That means um, rest, continue on um, in me. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. A branch cut off from the vine cannot bear fruit. <clears throat> Unless it abides in the vine, it has to stay in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. When we are resting in Jesus Christ through the power of the Spirit, Jesus Christ works through us by means of the Spirit. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So we are not the power by which we work, but Jesus Christ is the power in and through us to work and to will his way. For if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. When we are abiding in Christ, when he is the foundation of what we are asking for, uh, whatever we ask of him while we are in his will, 
he will bring about. Grace, age, positional truths. This is our last verse for tonight that I'm going to leave you all with. It says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. This is Paul speaking to us. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. The presence of the Holy Spirit within the believer is the means by which all of this is possible. Jesus Christ has given us this gift of the Holy Spirit, and we acquire the Spirit through faith alone. That when we have put our faith in Jesus Christ for the salvation in the last days, then the Spirit has come in and indwelled us. This cannot be undone. When the Spirit is dwelling within us, we do belong to him. If the Spirit does not indwell us, that means he has never indwelt us, which means we have never believed in Jesus Christ. So Paul is working backwards here. He says, you are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. So he is saying, you are in the spirit, if indeed the spirit dwells within you. So we want to rest in this truth that the spirit does rest within us. And we want to walk in the light so that the spirit can work in and through us. So when God reveals truth to us, when he reveals opportunity to us, we need to be prepared before we know his will to walk in his will. And if he doesn't give us opportunity, we have confidence that Jesus Christ knows our hearts and he knows that we are ready. He knows that our will is in alignment with his when we are abiding in him, we are resting in him. All right. <coughs> so that is the end of chapter three of first John. And uh, we can look forward to starting chapter four next week. All right, um, so I will close us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for your Son uh, and for the Spirit that we have confidence to come before the throne of God uh, because uh, of what he has done for us on the cross. And we have confidence that the Holy Spirit indwells us um, so that we are able to walk in the will of God, that we are able to know the light and to walk in it. We pray for those in our spheres who are not saved. We pray that they might come to know you, Lord Jesus, uh, and that they might come into fellowship with us um, at that point, and that we might stay in fellowship as well. And if we have fallen out of fellowship, um, I pray that you convict our hearts so that we're able to understand our sin, um, to know its presence, to know that we're not in fellowship with you, and to come back into fellowship with you. Lord, I pray all these things in your wonderful and glorious name. Amen. Amen.